Hi, I'm Katie, and this is just a quick little floss tube extra in which I thought I would sit and stitch with you for a little bit so you could see how I stitch, what I use, and why I make those choices. I get asked these questions a lot, and I thought the simplest way of answering them might be to just sit with you for a little while, do a little stitching on an ongoing whip, and then answer some of the questions that I've received. I'm sure I won't cover everything because this is just going to be a quick little video. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments. If there's anything I left out or didn't explain well, just let me know. I'm always very happy to share what I do and why. I would note that these are strictly my personal preferences. Nothing I do is right or wrong, just as nothing you do is right or wrong. These are just the things that I like and that I have found lead to good stitching. So today I am stitching on Cross Stitch Antiques, Oh Sweet Humility, Eliza Townsend's work, which I pulled out to share with you all because one, it's, Swasserfine on 45 count, which is not most stitchers choice, but which I really love. So I thought I'd show you my work with that. And because it's a larger piece of fabric and some people are interested in how I manage that because I do most often cross stitch in hand, as you can see. So what I do is I actually just kind of roll the fabric up like a jelly roll and expose only the section that I'm working on. That can lead to a lot of thread, which honestly, oh, sorry, a lot of extra fabric flopping around, which I'm actually used to. I was a sewer before I was a stitcher and you don't use hoops or frames or anything to keep all your excess fabric out of the way when you're hemming a dress or setting a sleeve. So I think that's something that sewers maybe are just more used to. It doesn't bother me. I do really recommend a hoop for most stitchers because it reduces distortion. You get less distortion with the poke and stab method as I'm using here and which I always use than the sewing method, but you still definitely get more distortion stitching in hand with any method than you would with a hoop because a hoop stabilizes the fabric from all angles and reduces distortion. So I have used a hoop when precision is important, notably on the Simple Harmony box. And the hoop that I use is just a lovely small oval hoop from Hardwick Manor. This should strictly be wrapped with twill tape, but I use it so seldom that I haven't actually bothered. It's not a particularly good habit and hoops are a wonderful thing to use if you like using them and you can use them. The reason I don't use them is something fairly specific to me. I think this probably doesn't apply to most people and it's that I have a little weakness in my hands and so the weight of a hoop can stress them out if I'm holding it for any length of time. It just aggravates an existing physical problem with my hands. That's probably not true of most people. So if you're watching this, I do really recommend the use of a hoop, even though I don't do it myself. To compensate for the distortion that my chosen method, stitching in hand, puts into the fabric, I wet block my finishes each and every time even when it's something quite small, like I just finished this yesterday. This is Stacy Nash Deck the Halls Pin Keep, which is also Swasserfine on 45 count. You can see the coverage is a little light, but if you look at it at a distance, that is beautiful, and I think it's going to look great on a tree. So you may not be able to see, but it's got pinholes in the edge. That's from where I blocked it yesterday. And as you can see, that just turned it perfectly smooth. The distortion is all gone. It's all squared out. So it's ready for a lovely and beautiful finish. But back to my own stitching. So that's how I compensate for what I do that isn't really ideal from the terms of 
well, from the sense of getting the best finish and the best results. Wet blocking can resolve pretty much any level of distortion that you put into your fabric. You just have to be consistent about doing it. And if you're less inclined to, or if you're working, say, with over-dyed cottons that aren't color stable, then you really might want to consider working in a hoop. Another question I get frequently is about the sharp and defined look of my crosses. And that is not really a method of anything that I do specifically. As you can see, I just take my needle and thread through linen and make crosses just like anybody else. Although when I'm block stitching, as you can see, I do like to work one leg of the cross and then come back and cross them in full rows. It just makes more logical sense to me and I think it results in a slightly neater stitch, but it's certainly not an essential thing. What was I saying? I don't actually know what I was saying. I think it was something about just, oh, the sharp. See, this is what happens when I don't have an outline. I just ramble. So the sharp and defined look of my crosses. It's not about how I stitch. It's about how I pair my thread with my linen. So what most people would call lighter coverage actually means that your thread has more room to sit very nicely in the weave. And so if you'd like to hear my thoughts about that, in more detail, that's all covered in the specialty thread tutorial, part one, where I talk about pairing all the different threads with counts to get this kind of look. And then to a lesser extent, it's also the result of the poke and stab method, which gives much more control over how your thread lies than with the sewing method. The way that you're pulling your thread through the stitch with the sewing method both adds more twist into the thread, more distortion into the fabric, and just gives you a lot less control over how your stitch looks and how your thread lies. Now, that's not to shame anyone who uses the sewing method. This is just to explain my personal preferences. If you've admired the look of my stitches and you use the sewing method, you may want to just give poke and stab a try, see how it changes the look, and then decide if the change is worth it to you. I have had a few people tell me that they were a long time adherence of the sewing method, but that they have changed to poke and stab after hearing me talk about that. However, if the sewing method is still for you, then that's totally fine too. Stitching should be fun and the sewing method is certainly faster than poke and stab. But that's why I use poke and stab even though I do stitch in hand and that I could be using the sewing method here. I wanted to explain that. So Swalserfine is quite a fine thread and I am using it with a number 10 short tapestry point beading needle. And even though that's quite a fine needle, the thread's still so fine that it can want to slip the eye. One thing I do to try and combat that is that when I thread the needle, I pinch the ends together and I just give it a little twist and that can kind of bend the thread and help it stay in the eye of the needle. But you still do have to watch it. The surfine is very, very fine and it does like to slip the eye of the needle. But that's easily enough remedy, you know. And let's talk about needles for just a second. So as you might be able to see, I have my Kuyana case next to me with some of the threads for this project in it. So I love this case just for, oh, everything and every, everything and anything because it has everything that I need. I don't need very much for my cross stitch. So I've got my backup pair of scissors here in the lid. They're anchored by just a needle minder with a strong magnet so it doesn't move around. 
I have my spools. I've got five here, and as you can see, there's room for plenty more, which covers you know most of what I would be actively working with at any one time for cross stitch. And then it's got this little pouch, which I put my most commonly used needles in and I carry those around with me so that I am never without in case I drop a needle, lose a needle, or you know, thought it was in the fabric, pull it out and oh it's not there. So my three most used needles are the number 10 tapestry pointed short beading needle which I use with 103 and Swa Goblins. The number 12 Short, taps, short beading tapestry point needles, both from non John James. I buy the 25 packs because I go through these things. And those I use with Swasserfine. And then a Bowen 28 tapestry, which I use with my metallics. So Bijou by itself or Accentuate paired with Swasserfine. If I'm going to pair Accentuate with the heavier 103, then I would go up to a number 26 tapestry needle. But again, that's all covered in the specialty thread tutorial. So a few other things about how I'm stitching. I am stitching on 45 count with Swasserfine, and I believe you should always pair your needle to your thread and not your fabric. So I'm using a finer needle, even though you can easily get through 45 count with a 10 short tapestry point beading needle because it should go with the thread and not with the fabric. If you have paired your thread with the right needle for it and the needle is fighting the wave, it's too big, then you might want to reconsider whether your thread is really the best choice for your account. But again, that's very much a matter of personal preference. There's wide variation among stitchers about coverage and again, there's no right or wrong. You might also notice that my index finger is pointing up in the air when I put the needle down. It actually doesn't when I bring the needle up. It stabilizes the fabric underneath. I think it's, I never noticed that until one day I was just stitching and noticed my index finger just waving around in the air. I was like, what is that? That is so odd because you would expect to stabilize your needle, right? I think that's how most people hold a needle. I do not. And I think it's actually a function of how I hold a pen or pencil. I do the same thing there. I hold it with these fingers and then I lay my index on the pen to stabilize it. Apparently, how I hold a needle is the same as how I hold a writing implement. And as you may have seen just there, I am left-handed, but I cross-stitch right-handed. Don't ask me why, it just feels most natural. When it comes to surface embroidery or to finishing, I often switch off between hands just according to what feels most natural to me and what makes sense with where I'm working. If you're on a big frame, sometimes it can just be easier to reach from one side or another, and therefore I switch sides accordingly. Oh, and I was also going to tell you, I'm working on 45 count, as I said. How many times have I said that now? Probably a lot of times, but you can't see me, so you don't know what am I using or not using, but I'll tell you. So I'm not using any supplemental lighting at the moment. My home has really wonderful natural light. It is an amazing luxury that I am incredibly thankful for. So during the day, I actually don't need anything at all, just the light in my house, unless it's cloudy or overcast. Um, night, obviously, I turn just the overhead lights on. I do have supplemental lighting that I use if I'm traveling. I find I don't need it in my home, but other places where you know it wasn't set up to stitch, essentially, I frequently do. And for that, I use a daylight um, Foldigo lamp, which I do recommend. I didn't get that out, unfortunately, but I'll link it in the description. It's a good light and has adjustable head and settings, and I do really like it. 
I also have a pair of readers, which I'm not wearing at the moment. So these are minor correction and I just use them in the evening to reduce eye strength. The light's not quite as good or if I'm working on 5363. I can see the weave without it, but I find that I get less eye strain if I've got my glasses on and I'm working with a very high count. For 45 count, I don't need it unless it's at night, at which point, as I said, um, the correction helps make up for, ooh, I think I caught a linen thread there. That does not want to go through for having less light. So I finish my thread off just by weaving it through stitches in at least two directions, preferably three, on the back of the linen. And this is the back of my piece. I am really good about not carrying threads. I think it's probably my best stitching habit. And then I'll just start a new thread quickly so you can see how I do it. I think I've probably covered a fair amount of what people might want to know. I'll talk about my scissors in just a second because I'm going to go ahead and start this thread with a pin stitch. And so I'm pulling my, just give that a twist and that just kind of helps hold it in the eye of the needle. Roll this back up. So I think here I'm going to start my thread there and start working across on this next section. I'm just filling in here as seems most logical to me, which may not actually already make sense, but I am going to start with a pin stitch. So I have been doing this much more regularly in recent months. I went to the attic and I met Jean Lee in person for the first time in April. She was showing me her preferred scissors, leaned in and said, do you like to do the pin stitch with this very expectant look on her face? There was definitely a right and wrong answer there. And oh, it was like getting asked by the dentist if you floss regularly, because at that time the answer was, um, sometimes when it's necessary. It wasn't a regular habit with me, but it has become one since I started stitching on AKJIT because of the very detailed motifs, the dark thread on the light linen. It just has made more sense to use the pin stitch each and every time, and it has really grown on me. It's become a habit, and my preferred method of starting, although it wasn't always. So if the pin stitch hasn't been your friend in the past, you can always go back to it and give it a try. I think it's one of those things you just kind of have to get in the habit of, and then before you know it, you'll be doing it every time without thinking about it, which of course you don't have to, but if it's something that you've struggled with, you know, I'd encourage you to go back and give it another look. This is not a tutorial on the pin stitch, but the critical points, in my opinion, are to make sure that you're piercing your thread in both directions. That's critical to keep it stable. And a way that you can know if you are piercing your thread in both directions is just to give your working thread a little tug and see if the end or the stitches move. If they do, you haven't gotten it. So go back and try again before you cut your thread. It's really essential to make sure that your start is stable if you're going to use the pin stitch. The other really critical point is to clip your thread as close to the base as humanly possible without getting either your stitches or the linen. And that does require a fair degree of precision with your scissors and with using your scissors. And for that reason, this is my daily use pair. I keep less expensive storks in my case as a backup, but these are by Monsieur Rouleau. They're very special and oh, his scissors are just works of art. We lost a wonderful artist and craftsman when he died. But 
The reason these are my daily use scissors is everybody talks about his wonderful artistry, the beautiful designs and the exquisite engraving, and that's all true, but they're also the most functional scissors you will ever find in your life because of how incredibly fine those blades are. The finest that I have ever come across and I have tried many scissors. So that's why these are my daily use scissors for pretty much everything because they give me a degree of precision that I don't generally find. However, <laughs> Those are no longer available. I do also keep them in their proper case, which is why they're not in my Kiana case. I don't want them rattling around in the lid. They were expensive. But a good option are curved tip scissors. This is Jean Lee's favorite pair. They're from the Scissorist. I do also really like these. They have quite fine tips and blades as well. Not as fine as the Monsieur Rouleau, but really suited to the purpose. And the thing about a curved tip scissor is that you've got less area of the blade um, sitting on your base when you're clipping. And you also don't have those tips right against the fabric. So you're much less likely to erroneously cut something you didn't mean to cut. If you're less confident in your scissor handling, this is a really great place to start. They're much less expensive. They've got all the function needed for good, sharp, and precise cuts. And what I particularly appreciate about these is that they're not handed. A lot of scissors, sorry, a lot of curved blade scissors are. Dovo does make a left-handed pair, which I own. I prefer these, quite frankly, but some other makers like Kai, which I know a lot of embroiderers swear by, are handed and they are only right-handed. Because as I said, I'm left-handed and while I can comfortably stitch with either hand, one thing I absolutely cannot do is use scissors with my right hand. I always have to do that left-handed. I just, for whatever reason, am not comfortable using scissors with my right hand either, even though I am otherwise pretty much fully ambidextrous. So I'm trying to think if there was anything else particularly relevant to how I stitch or why. I can't really think of anything at the second. If you have any questions, if I forgot something, I'm sure I did. That's what happens when I try and film without an outline is that I just babble and forget things I definitely meant to say. But if there's anything that I forgot or that you'd like to know, just please feel free to go ahead and ask me a question in the comments and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Again, for my wider thoughts on how you get these sharp defined crosses by matching your choice of thread to your linen count, that's all covered at length in the specialty thread tutorial part one. And then there's a written guide in the description that's kind of like the spark notes guide to everything I said in it because the tutorial there is quite long. So go ahead and ask me any questions. I hope that you have enjoyed stitching with me today or that this was helpful, interesting, or useful to you in some way. I'll see you again on my next floss tube. And until we meet again, happy stitching.